everybody. Um, I'm Nick Carlson. Um, I mainly work on portable crushing permits and um, surface coating permits. Um, and today, um, for my part of the presentation, we're going to cover some key concepts and terms related to air quality and air permitting. So to start, um, we will cover the definition of a permit to install. Um, so what is a permit to install? So the bolded words on this slide are key concepts of this definition that we want you to hold on to and pay some close attention to. Um, so a permit to install, also called a PTI, is a legally enforceable document. Um, and this is very important to emphasize. Um, without your PTI, you can't install or modify um, your equipment. Um, you have to get your PTI first. Um, and this includes emission limits and other requirements that will apply to your facility. Um, it also authorizes your company to build or modify a process as described in your permit application. So when we approve a PTI, we're approving a specific project. Um, for example, if your application was for a natural gas fired boiler, your permit won't allow you to install a wood fired boiler instead. That would be a separate permit application. Um, so there's another term embedded in this definition that I want to cover, um, and that's air contaminant. So an air contaminant is a dust, fume, gas, uh, mist, odor, smoke, vapor, or any combination of those. Um, it's a term defined in part one of the Michigan Air Pollution Control Rules, where you can find pretty much the majority of these definitions as well. Um, air contaminants can be found in solid states and liquid states and are referred to as particulates. Um, and many air contaminants can be in a gaseous state. Um, there's a lot of different families of air contaminants um, and we'll discuss those on the next slides here. So um, one of these families of air contaminants is referred to as criteria pollutants. So these are particulate matter equal to or less than 10 microns in diameter, um, also known as PM10. And then we have particulate matter equal to or less than two and a half microns in diameter or PM2.5. Um, in addition to that, we've got sulfur dioxide or SO2, nitrogen dioxide, NO2, ozone, carbon monoxide, and lead. So, before we discuss other families of pollutants, why are these ones grouped together and called criteria pollutants? Um, well, that is because the EPA sets certain standards for them known as the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or as you'll often see it, the NAAQS or NAAQS. So these standards were developed after the Federal Clean Air Act required the EPA to establish a maximum allowable pollutant concentration in the ambient air that may cause harm to the public or sorry, public health or welfare. Um, so national standards have been established for each of these criteria pollutants. And um, the next consists of both primary standards and secondary standards. Primary standards are protective of public health, while secondary standards are protective of public welfare. Um, this includes things like soil, vegetation, um, and structures. So the, the Michigan Air Quality Division, we monitor air pollution and compare the air quality with the NACs. Um, we have over 40 different monitoring locations statewide um, and several hundred instruments for measuring air pollution and meteorological, <laughs> sorry, meteorological parameters. Um, if an area is meeting the standards, it's said to be in attainment um, of the standard. If it's not, then it's considered non-attainment. Um, and we'll kind of get into those terms a little bit later. So how does this relate to PTIs? Um, when we review your permit applications, we're going to be looking at potential emissions from your project to make sure they're not going to violate any of these standards of the NACs. So um, there's a lot of other families of air contaminants, but we're just going to cover two more of them right now. Um, and one of these is hazardous air pollutants, or HACs. Um, hazardous air pollutants, these are defined in a list of approximately 188 compounds that are identified by the EPA. 
Um, and when we say approximately, that's because the EPA will occasionally add or remove a compound from the list. Um, so it can change from time to time, depending on you know, various factors. Um, so facilities that emit these compounds are regulated through what's called the National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants, or NESHAPs for short. So the next definition um, that we're gonna cover is the last family of air contaminants, um, toxic air contaminants. Um, these are typically abbreviated to TACs, which you'll probably hear quite a bit when we get to that portion of the presentation. Um, and according to part one of the Michigan Air Pollution Control Rules, a TAC is any substance that is or may become harmful to public health or the environment. Um, those can be regulated as a TAC, except for a specific list of substances that have been excluded as stated in the definition of attack. Um, so these will be in the, the part one rules, we'll have the definitions for that. So now we're gonna kind of look at, um, we're gonna compare tax with HAPs. On the next, there we go. <laughs> um, so since tax and HAPs can seem very similar, um, this slide is gonna kind of outline how they're different. So HAPs are regulated by the federal government. Um, as I stated before, they're set by the EPA, um, whereas tax are regulated only in Michigan. So these are kind of specific to the state. Um, and then with HAPs, they're regulated under the NESHAPs or National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants, um, whereas tax are regulated under Michigan rules 224 to 233. Um, so with HAPS, you have your defined list of approximately 188 chemicals, whereas for tax, um, it includes any chemical unless it's specifically not a tax, which, as I said before, is it'll be listed in that definition for a tax. Um, and a HAP can also be a tax. An example of this would be formaldehyde, which is both a HAP and a tax. Um, so the next definition we're going to cover, and a very important one, that you'll want to know before we talk or before we jump into talking about permitting as an emission unit. Um, an emission unit is a process or process equipment that emits or may emit one or more air contaminant. Um, this term is frequently used throughout the PTI process and the emission unit is often um, abbreviated to EU. Um, so on the next slides we're going to go into a bit more depth on defining emission units. So an emission unit can be made up of one or more devices. You have a process device, control device, and stack devices. So a process device is a piece of equipment or activity that generates air contaminants. This would be things like a paint booth or a boiler. Um, and control devices are equipment that collects, destroys, or minimizes the release of air contaminants. Um, an example of this would be a bag house filter or a wet scrubber. Um, and stack devices are conduits to carry the air contaminants outdoors. So sometimes it can be challenging to determine how to divide up equipment into different emission units. Um, the AQD has a guidance policy on this, which can be found on Eagle's website, which we have linked here. So when you get the slides, you'll be able to click on that and it'll take you right where you need to go. Um, so the first step is going to be to look at whether the process and control devices are identified in a specific regulation. So if they are, then they're considered a single emission unit. Um, regulations can be applicable to a single process device. Um, for example, Rule 611, which covers existing coal cleaners, or it can be applicable to multiple process devices, um, like Rule 621 would be existing metallic surface coating lines, which would cover the whole line. So if step one doesn't apply, then a process device or multiple devices connected to a common control device or controlled by the same work practice is considered an emission unit. So this would be something like three grinder being connected to a cyclone connector. 
So if step one and two don't apply, we move on to step three, um, which would be a grouping of two or more process devices that are functionally dependent. Um, <clears throat> these can be considered an emission unit. So this would be like a series of tanks used to play metal parts. Um, and then if steps <clears throat> one through three don't apply, you move on to step four, um, which would be a process device not subject to specific regulation, it's uncontrolled, and it operates independently as an emission unit. So next, we're gonna kind of look at an example. So here we have an example, which is also example two in the workbook. Um, this example states that they have an aluminum furnace with a bag house and a stack. So how many emission units are in this example process? So let's think back to AQD 6 policy and procedure. Um, that was mentioned and linked in the slide with steps one and two. Um, so step one of the policy says a process and control device identified in a state or federal regulation are considered one emission unit. So in this example, the furnace, the bag house, and the stack are subject to NESHAP subpart 3R for secondary aluminum production. And because the process can meet step one in this example, it's considered one single emission unit. Now on to the next example, we have two coating lines sharing a curing oven and they have a regenerative thermal oxidizer also called an RTO um, and a stack. So how many emission units do we have here in this example? Um, and before we look at the policy and procedure, you're gonna to wanna to determine the types of devices in this process. Um, so if you look closely, you'll notice there are two process devices generation, generating emissions. You have your wood coating and your plastic coating lines. Um, the one can, and then you also have one control device, which is your RTO. Um, and before we move on to the next slide, I just wanna point out that the problem statement saying wood coating is regulated under 620 and the plastic coating is regulated under 632. So we've got two different regulations um, for each of the lines. So the number of emission units in this example would be two. Um, each of the coating lines were subject to a different regulation and were able to meet step one of the policy and procedure. Um, and the definition of coating line in the regulations includes applicators, flash off areas, drying areas, and ovens. So the bake oven would also be part of both emission units in this case. So here's one more example of emission units that we'll cover today. Um, you can follow along with this one, which is example five in the workbook. So in this example, we have a degreaser, we have a paint booth, and we have an oven. So let's look at the type of devices we have in this example. Um, you have two process devices. You have your degreaser and your coating line. So like in the previous example, the definition of coating line in the regulations would include your ovens. So the bake oven would consider, or is considered to be part of the coating line. Um, and when reading step one of the policy and procedure, the degreaser and the coating line are subject to different regulations. Therefore, the degreaser is one emission unit and the coating line um, consisting of the paint booth and the oven is another emission unit. Um, and there are a few other emission unit examples in the PTI workbook that you can review on your own for some further practice if you need to. Um, um, so let's move on to our next definition which is flexible group. So a flexible group is um, kind of a grouping of emission units. So a facility might have quite a few emission units and we often group them together in a permit, especially if they have similar regulatory requirements. Um, and a flexible group abbreviated um, FG, it helps us keep the permit shorter and more concise by avoiding repetition. 
Um, and the next term we have is stationary source. Um, in air quality discussions, you might hear a facility called a stationary source. Um, this consists of all emission units at the facility. Um, and it may seem like a strange way to refer to a factory or a plant, but it means that the source of emissions doesn't move as opposed to a vehicle, which is a mobile source of emissions. Um, so when we say stationary source, we're talking about all of the emission units at the facility, um, including any exempt equipment. So we have an example um, right here for a stationary source. So they have their emission units, which are noted in the green boxes. Um, which all have names starting with EU, short for emission unit, as we said before. Um, and then we have some emission units grouped together into flexible groups, um, which are noted by the purple boxes. Also um, abbreviated FG. Um, so we've got flexible groups for the furnaces and for the heat treating, and all of these are encompassed under the same stationary source. So moving on to the last thing we have to talk about before we dig into discussing permitting, um, this is the concept of major and minor sources. So a stationary source is considered major if it has potential emissions that would meet or exceed established thresholds. Um, these thresholds have been set for specific air contaminants or for groups of air contaminants. Um, and a source that doesn't meet or exceed these thresholds would be considered a minor source. So there are different types of major sources that we want to briefly cover on this slide. Um, we haven't introduced every term on the slide yet. And since this is just a workshop for beginners right now, we, you know, we won't get into major source topics in too much depth. Um, but we want to at least introduce these terms just so that, um, if, you know, if you hear them later on, you'll have an idea what we're talking about. Um, so when you say major source, um, the meaning of that all depends on which rule or regulation you're talking about. Um, so if a source can emit 100 tons per year or more of criteria pollutants, um, then that source will be a major source under Title V of the Clean Air Act. Um, and in Michigan, the Title V permits are called ROPs or Renewable Operating Permits. Um, ROPs have to be renewed every five years. Um, so that'll be that first box there. Um, and then if a source can emit 25 tons per year or more of all HAPs or 10 tons per year or more of an individual HAP, then that source is a major source of HAPs. Um, they have to comply with any major source NESHAP regulations. Um, NESHAP standing for um, National Emission Standards of Hazardous Air Pollutants, as stated before. Um, and they have to get an ROP. Um, and that's that second box there. Um, and then if a source can emit 25 tons, or sorry, 250 ton per year of regulated pollutants, um, this is a family of pollutants we haven't talked about, but essentially it includes criteria pollutants and a few others. Um, then that source is considered a major source under the federal new source review regulations. Um, this includes something called PSD, um, which is short for prevention of significant deterioration and non-attainment new source review, um, NESR. Um, and for certain types of sources, um, the threshold for PSD and NA NSR is 100 tons per year instead of 250. Um, so that should cover the remainder of the terms and definitions.